So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Aaron DeLong. I'm the Delaware Valley Hub Program Manager for PASA. I'm also the lead administrator for Dairy Grazing Apprenticeship in Pennsylvania, New Jersey. Um, I want to welcome everybody today for our webinar, uh, Dairy Grazing Strategies for Optimal Nutrition. Very pleased to have Dr. Greg Brickner from Organic Valley as our featured speaker today. Uh, the order of events is going to be, we're going to uh, play a pre-recorded presentation that Dr. Brickner uh, did last week. Um, and then we're gonna have a live uh, question and answer conversation period uh, with Dr. Brickner. Um, if you have questions that arise during the presentation or even right now, you can just post them in the chat, uh, chat box at the bottom of your screen and uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll, we'll start addressing those questions. And, um, and if necessary, we can ask you to unmute and uh, elaborate on what you, what you asked. But in general, we ask you to stay muted. Um, we will have an evaluation of this event. A uh, link will be put in the chat box at the end of the, end of the hour. And we ask you to take a few moments and to complete that. Uh, basically telling us how we did, letting us know what would be good to do in the future, and also helping us report to our funders who keep these events free about the work we're doing. Um, I don't know if there's, I think the one other thing I would say is PASA recently uh, received a grant from the Northeast Dairy Business Innovation Center that is going to uh, help fund farmers who are wishing to transition to grazing or increase their grazing acreage. Um, it's a two year uh, cohort program where people are put into groups that are all in a transition to grazing phase. And at the end of those two years, uh, farmers that participate can receive $5,000 towards uh, improving their grazing system. So they could buy fencing or put it towards water systems. We're gonna re release an open application for that program in the next week or two. So if you think that might be of interest to you or someone you know, uh, stay posted on that. You could also reach out to me at Aaron at PASAFarming.org if you wanna learn more. This is very new, but I felt like this audience, it's relevant to say that. Okay, again, uh, please put your questions in the chat and in about 45 minutes, we'll, uh, we'll go live with Dr. Berkner. I'll also note that the audio occasionally slows down on this recording. Uh, it was our internet connection and it's not your computer. Hi there, um, my name is Greg Brickner. I'm glad to join you this afternoon. Um, I am a veterinarian and uh, grazing uh, uh, consultant uh, dealing with grazing issues for the Organic Valley uh, Dairy Cooperative and um, been asked to, to talk here about um, uh, managing perennial pastures uh, for grazing dairy cattle. And uh, I, there's a particular point I wanted to, to bring out today. Um, and that is, um, as the slide says, being serious about perennials, then, uh, you know, the use of perennials gets, gets a lot of, uh, you know, lip service then, but uh, usually discussions uh, amongst dairy farmers heads towards what annuals are we planting this year? Um, how can we, you know, for some people is minimizing the, the use of, uh, of pasture as well too then. And there's been a lot of uh, nice research uh, recently that uh, has really been able to, to guide us more on uh, how, how uh, the, the fiber portion of our forages is digested in the rumen and how we can improve that and how we can measure that through testing then. And so I'd like to maybe bring out some of that more and, and help uh, help us feel more comfortable and able to, to utilize uh, perennial systems for, for feeding our dairy cattle then. So first off, I just wanna talk about a few, few terms that get thrown about resilience, uh, stability, robustness. They're all uh, described different um, um, agricultural systems then. And basically we all kind of understand what that means. 
uh, that in the face of uh, challenges, uh, both small and large, then it doesn't have to be disaster challenges. It can be a day-to-day -day fluctuation in temperature or whatever. Um, some systems are able to maintain uh, more stability, more evenness in production, fewer uh, than than other higher uh, input systems. Then, and here in the in these couple of graphs, the the uh, more robust, more stable agricultural system is in the dotted line, and um, you can see that the higher input, um, higher yield. Uh, systems uh, are in the solid line, they have the potential to yield more. And that's one thing we need. Most of us have, have come to terms with that we've selected a system uh, through grazing and organics that uh, we trade off uh, the high yield for stability, resilience, uh, and robustness then. Um, and I just, the reason I'm bringing that forward is sometimes I think you know, even myself, we, you, you, uh, you get, you see an article or you read an advertisement uh, promoting uh, the yield or productivity, um, or you see animals that, you know, yield really well, uh, high milk production, and you think, you know, I should be pursuing that and, and really just remind ourselves that we really are selecting a system then, um, both in the crops that we grow uh, and the animals that eat those crops and that, that we raise for that then, and, and to, to keep those in line. Uh, for example, you know, trying to, to raise, um, you know, Holstein genetics that are really intended for uh, complete confinement and TMR feeding and trying to graze those animals in, uh, you know, it, it just, it, it's not a good fit um, it, it ends up uh, not working out well, both for animal productivity and the farmer's satisfaction too. So uh, read an article, uh, see an advertisement that, um, you know, we really want to be thinking about our farms as systems. Okay. And so this, um, this uh, discussion, again, is going to be about how we can utilize perennials to uh, adequately and profitably feed our, our dairy cattle then. And what it's going to come down to in, in the differentiation is pointing out that, uh, that uh, ruminants in uh, high forage systems, they utilize the cell wall part of a plant. So these are two very thin sections of living plants. Uh, and the cell contents are the green and the liquid uh, within the cell walls. Uh, that contains the proteins, the sugars, the soluble carbohydrates, really the things that get, again, more attention than, you know, we look at forage samples, you know, th those are the parts that get focused on, unfortunately, um, you know, but really those cell contents are what we could digest. If we were to eat grass, we would still get some nutrients and it would be from these cell contents. Um, ruminants, they can make use of the cell walls. And, you know, in a dry matter basis, those cell walls are half or more. Of, of the total dry matter. So thinking about feeding our ruminants, our dairy cattle from those cell walls, rather than concentrating on what's inside those cells. And I'd like to do this by um, uh, point this out with a couple of forage samples then. And this is really where the, the new information is uh, coming out then. Um, for understanding how we can get energy from, from these cell walls. Um, this, I'm going to start with this uh, forage sample. This happens to be from my own farm in Wisconsin. Uh, this would be a third crop uh, grass baleage uh, harvested in 2020. And this is a, at least a 15-year-old hay field, um, predominantly uh, orchard grass and brome grass, because that's what grows here. Um, but there's true diversity in here. There's, you know, uh, a lot of different grass species, about maybe 10 to 15 percent uh, mixed legumes, some forbs in here. Um, you know, this is this is real diversity, not just uh, starting off with a lot of different species in a seed bag then. And um, the management uh, that I do comes in and other people that are utilizing perennials 
from managing the fertility, keeping the density of these stands proper, and then really working on how we harvest them, getting the timing of the harvest and, and the speed of the harvest. Um, in this, this particular forage sample, again, is, you know, if you were to look at this, you would say this is, you know, this is all grass. This is a grassy hay. How could it possibly feed dairy cows? And so there's a couple of things I'd like to point out here. The first uh, is this uh, circled number, the NDF, neutral detergent fiber, which really expresses all of the fiber, all of the cell wall that's in this forage then. Um, and this particular sample has 51% cell walls. Um, usually when we're, you know, historically when we look at forage samples, people would, would want this uh, cell wall portion, this fiber portion to be as low as possible. Again, going back to thinking about what's inside the cells rather than, than those cell walls. But now we have new ways of, of looking at this, this uh, fiber portion. And that is down here, what we call the, the, uh, the fiber digestibility. So the neutral detergent fiber digestibility, NDFD, and then the 30 stands for 30 hours. And so what they did is they took my feed sample, put it in a, uh, a little nylon pouch and dropped it into rumen fluid. And after 30 hours, um, which is about the average stay for a, a forage and a healthy functioning rumen, uh, about 50, 53% of that total cell wall was digested and, utilize, and, and is utilizable by the cow. So once that fiber is digested um, by the bacteria, the energy value of it is exactly the same as the energy coming from starch or coming from sugar. Um, and so this is actually truly valuable uh, energy for the cow. And so the way we can think about this is if we go to this bottom square down here, this forage sample is telling us that 51% of all the dry matter in this forage is NDF or cell wall fiber. And now we know too that 53% of this can be digested by the cow in that 30 hour window. So 27% of this, of this total forage uh, is, is energy available to the cow uh, from digesting fiber. Now the sugar, if you look farther in here, the sugar portion was 9% uh, of the total amount of dry matter. So you can see that the cell walls are far more important, even though again, those sugars uh, attract a lot of attention. So let's take another forage sample. And this is uh, an alfalfa baleage grown for sale, organic, uh, available through the Organic Valley grower pool and you know, put on trucks and shipped around the country then. And, at a very high price then, a very high price. And somebody would look at this forage sample, go immediately to the crude protein, see, oh my gosh, it's over 26% crude protein. The fiber portion is really outstanding forage. And it, it is in its way then. Um, but if we're gonna look at, again, how much energy is available uh, in this forage, uh, now, uh, we've we've got the forage digest the fiber digestibility here. We we've got thirty percent of this sample is cell wall fiber, and we're going to multiply that. the uh, The lab is telling us that fifty percent of that cell wall it is digestible and available to the cow. Uh, so we end up with twenty one percent of that. Uh, total dry matter in this forage uh, is energy available from the fiber and 4% is available from sugar. So let's go back to that uh, previous sample. We said this, this uh, sample has 27% uh, energy of it from fiber and this one's only 21% uh, and actually lower sugar too. So this, you know, very expensive forage actually has less energy than uh, a well-harvested uh, perennial grass hay field that maybe your, your neighbor had or, or you have yourself by just taking care of it. It's actually a, a higher energy forage than, than this one. The other thing to, uh, to look at when we're trying to put together total rations for, for cows or think about the total ration, 
again, we come up to the protein on this grass forage sample, it's 17 and percent uh, crude protein. That turns out to be the, the, uh, the final uh, amount of protein we want in a dairy cow's ration. It needs to be about 17 and percent protein. So really this forage is closer to what a dairy cow needs. And my argument is that this kind of forage, whether it comes from this baleage sample or from pasture, is closer to what uh, the dairy cow needs and really should make up the majority of a ration then. Um, and that this kind of a sample, this uh, alfalfa baleage with the high crude protein really should be thought of more as a supplement. If we were just to feed only this to, uh, to our dairy cows, uh, they would not do well on it at all. They'd be short on energy and they'd have to deal with all this extra crude protein then. Uh, and that requires energy as well. So this would be the situation like an early spring pasture where cows are losing weight. Uh, they've got excess protein or the MUNs uh, are, have gone high. So really this is more of a supplement. If you find yourself in a situation where um, the total ration, you'd like to add more forage as a supplement, but you need some protein, this would be a perfect uh, forage to add. You know, three to five pounds of this at, at most would be, would be sufficient. The same goes, I don't have a forage sample from a summer annual, say a BMR sorghum Sudan, um, something like that with high energy, um, high sugar content to that to that main pasture, that main perennial forage in the winter time. Um, they bring in some extra sugars um, and uh, some dig indigestible forage as well, but they don't have enough protein. And really they should be thought of as uh, an energy supplement in a, high, in a high forage ration, just like this is a protein supplement in a high forage ration. Okay. So in order to make those, all that energy uh, from those cell walls available, we need to have a healthy functioning rumen though. And uh, a quick um, reminder of the rumen structure. Um, this is the rumen on the left here. We've got basically three, three different levels here. This is, this is the gas level here on top uh, where all the cow burps come from. This would be the long forage, that forage mat. Uh, when a cow first swallows uh, her first bite of, uh, of feed uh, pasture, this is where it goes to. And then this is where the material that she chews cuds also comes from. So this is where the bacteria are breaking down that longer fiber. When I said it needs to be in there for 30 uh, hours, this is, this is where it's sitting. And as it gets digested, it drops down into this lower part of the rumen that is uh, more liquidy and fine particles. And from there is uh, where that feed material goes uh, to the rest of the intestines over here then. So we can't see what's going on inside the rumen, but it turns out that manure is a really good proxy for letting us see what's going on there. Um, and this is uh, a nice Goldilocks scenario. We've got too thin, just right, and too firm. And depending on what kind of manure we're seeing, we can kind of project and, and visualize what's going on in the rumen. When we've got super loose manure, we just don't have enough uh, long fiber, tall fiber uh, staying in the top there. That fiber is not staying in the rumen long enough to be properly digested. And not only is this loose manure, but it represents uh, lost energy from that fiber that did not get digested here. So if we see manure like this, we need, uh, we need more fiber. We need to slow down that fermentation, either with feeding stored forages or giving a longer rest period to our pastures. This is really what we're looking for. This classic cow, cow pat, um, you know, ends up being an inch and a half, two inches high um, and, and kind of holds, holds some form then. That's when we know that the fiber has been digested about as well as it could be that. And then this situation on the right, uh, this might be uh, 
an overmature forage. The all it sits in that room and just too long, and the cow is not going to get enough energy from it then. So in this case, we want a little less fiber. Substitute some of that overmature forage for some less mature forages then. But really develop a, a keen eye and, and paying attention to the quality of the manure um, throughout the year and throughout the grazing season. Okay, so what does this look like uh, on pasture now? So this is our sigmoid growth curve. Um, so early, this is kind of, this dark blue line describes how a pasture grows and the plants within it are growing in. They start off slowly in the spring or after a grazing episode, and then they reach a certain amount uh, of green leaf material to the point where they can grow just as fast as they can. And this is that exponential phase. And this is really where we wanna manage our pastures at is in, is, is in this phase right here is when the grasses will recover and grow the fastest. And then where this growth curve flattens out, that's when, uh, we're either getting mature seed heads or uh, grass has just been rested a very long time. And so things happen in, in these grass plants that affect digestibility and the nutrition too, obviously then. And really this is comes, it uh, very closely mimics what we started with those two forage samples that we had. Grazing uh, super lush, um, here I have it at six inches tall. Um, the proteins can be, you know, in the mid 20s. Uh, the amount of uh, cell wall is uh, about 40%. Um, so, kind of what you'd expect from that super high uh, alpha alpha baleage. Um, and it's that fiber is very digestible, but there's not very much fiber there. If we give it some more time to grow, and basically that's what we do as we move, as we move to the right across this curve, we're just giving a longer rest period. We get to a point where we don't have seed heads, it's still growing quickly, but the crude protein now is more and closer to the uh, total ration needs for that cow. She doesn't have to deal with a lot of excess protein. More of those cell walls have accumulated. So now we've got a, a 50 plus percent uh, NDF uh, or total cell walls. And again, we're getting away from that thinking that higher is worse then. Here we've got more, uh, more cell wall, it's gonna keep that feed in the room and longer. Um, and it also is just the pool for, for that energy source. And it turns out that the digestibility is pretty darn close to what that alpha 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 baleage was. So we're actually getting more energy by waiting a little bit longer, letting, the, uh, letting those plants get a bit taller then. Okay. And moving away from just the feed quality, um, it turns out that uh, if we graze in this period uh, that I said was best for the cow's overall nutritional needs, it turns out it's also best for the plants too. They develop uh, a more resilient stand, deeper roots, um, and also the cows tend to produce higher butter fat off of this kind of pasture versus the shorter uh, grazing lush uh, with the short rest period, then um, both that both the animals and the plants are less resilient, less uh, less healthy in the long term. Then, and if we waited really long rest periods, we get into a mob grazing situation, which is just plain not appropriate for lactating dairy cows. Uh, there are some other places we can use it at other groups of animals, but um, it really should be avoided with uh, lactating dairy cows. Okay. So in that curve we just looked at, um, I was kind of describing on the left, it was talking about height, uh, height of the pastures as, as sort of a way to judge the, the quality then. And it turns out that height is really not uh, the best indicator and a technique called uh, leaf counting uh, on grass tillers turns out to be uh, a better way of understanding how much um, uh, roots and recovery that plant has done and, and kind of what the feed quality is. Has, has it had enough time to, to accumulate that cell wall, uh, a digestible cell wall, and maybe decrease the amount of protein then? This is a, a better way of understanding where the plant is in its life cycle then. 
So grasses grow by producing new tillers. That is their version of a new stem. They grow out of either the base of a bunch grass or uh, through the soil from an underground rhizome as, as certain species spread then. But this is their stem, uh, just like an oak tree would have a stem with leaves coming off of it. This grass has a tiller, we call that tiller the stem, and new green leaves grow out of, out of that as, it, as we uh, rest it then. And we can count these, and we want to see at least a minimum of three leaves. If we get three full leaves, uh, we know that that plant is, is uh, at a minimum uh, kind of quality for us that we're looking for. So we count uh, half leaves. So in this example, we've got uh, a half dead leaf, but a half green leaf. So that's a half leaf, one full leaf, a second full leaf, a third full leaf, and we've got a half, leaf, half uh, exposed new developing leaf then. And so this would be described as a four leaf tiller. And if I were to walk out into a pasture and try to decide if it's ready to be grazed, I would sample 10 tillers a little randomly and across uh, a couple of different uh, grass species as well, just to make sure that uh, we're right. And if those 10 average about three plus uh, leaves per tiller, then it's good to, good to be grazed then. Um, one note about this, uh, you know, I said three leaves is the minimum. This shows a four leaf tiller. This original work came out of Australia, New Zealand, where pretty much the only grass they're concerned with is perennial ryegrass. And uh, you'll see notes on that, the perennial ryegrass after that third leaf, the, when the, new, the next leaf is emerging, the oldest leaf begins to die off. But most of our species, um, other than perennial ryegrass here, can develop more than three green leaves. And we can get four, even five green leaves on a tiller. So just a, a note if you've read material coming out of those places. And so why count, why count leaves then rather than, rather than looking at height? And I just have a series of pictures um, of, of grasses with the, that height in the middle, that's in inches. Um, and then just looking at what, how that compares to their the leaf count then. So here are two three leaf tillers. Um, you know, if the top of those leaves would flop down and it would be probably 12 to 14 inch tall pasture. Nobody would have any trouble deciding that that, that pasture was ready to be grazed. But the problem happened uh, it happens when we, we get variations in uh, between species, uh, soil types, climate, fertility. And so here we've got two three leaf tillers. Um, the one on the right is at the same physiological state as the plant on the left. This, is a, this becomes now an issue of yield. Um, you know, there won't be as much pasture out in that field on the right, and you'll have to allow for more room but they're both at the same stage and could be grazed uh, with, with the same effect on the cows and, and also on the plant. Again, an issue of uh, fertility uh, and yield between the, the plants on the left and the right. Uh, this would be uh, a change in species. So this is uh, bluegrass and it's quite difficult to tell the difference between uh, two leaf tillers and three leaf tillers, especially if we're walking around in that pasture then. Um, and it would be pretty easy to, to graze this pasture too soon, overgraze it um, without, without doing a, a leaf count on this particular field. There's orchard grass. So this these plants uh, were probably grazed down to six inches. Um, and we all have seen how orchard grass responds to, to, to cutting or grazing. Seems like in a day or two later, you can see new growth. That new growth is actually the older leaves uh, just extending and becoming longer elongating then. We really don't have any new leaves developing then. So these are all you know, too, too immature even though that pasture, you may walk out into it and see that it's about 10 inches tall, you'd think that would be ready to graze. But if you did, you'd be uh, damaging these plants. 
And sometimes we've got super fertile situation that that uh, tiller on the left is 12 inches tall, but it's only at the two leaf stage. Um, and so it would need some time. And if we were to graze it now, we would be damaging it. And it, would, it wouldn't have uh, the right kind of fiber and protein composition for the cows as well. Okay, I think I'd already mentioned before that uh, most of our uh, perennial grass species other than perennial ryegrass can develop more than three green leaves. But as we uh, rest, this picture isn't great, but this leaf here is brown, this leaf here is brown. Um, and so obviously this is lower feed quality. Uh, I actually took a, a sample of, of uh, dead leaves, those bottom dead leaves then, and you can see that the digestibility is quite a lot lower then. And so I kind of define the limits of uh, where we want to graze these perennial grasses as a minimum of three leaves, three green leaves per tiller, and a maximum of the time when we start to accumulate just too many of these dead leaves in a sward, uh, lowering forage quality then. But it's gonna, that time is gonna vary with time of year, again, climate, everything then. Uh, so we don't have a specific uh, day's rest to be made then. So there is one, uh, ex there's a few farms I've been on where uh, those, those dead leaves that accumulated in the sward were actually a benefit then. So these were farms that 100% of the ration was pasture at the time. And those, uh, those uh, hold uh, the, the greener forages in, in that upper level of the rumen. And, uh, and kept the digestion of the rest of the green forages uh, in, in a good state. The cows were in good body condition too. So, um, you know, that, that is the exception though, more than the rule. If, if you're not feeding, if you're feeding some supplements in the barn, uh, which we'll get to, and I probably uh, would recommend, then we're gonna try and stay away from the accumulation of these dead leaves. Okay, now I'd like to move to uh, uh, rest periods and how that affects uh, forage quality in the pasture uh, throughout the year. And this is just a, a, a great graph. We just take a minute to, to look at the, the, uh, the green triangles represent the forage digestibility, the, the NDF or cell wall digestibility. The red is the total amount of that cell wall or NDF available. And then the blue is the protein. And you can see in the springtime, uh, we all know that, that, uh, that the forage quality changes really, really quickly. Then you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, once, once those uh, plants begin to flower, uh, digestibility uh, drops off quickly then. So we all know that. Uh, but there's a few other points I'd like to bring out that are happening in the plant at that time of the year. So here's two orchard grass plants in, in May, uh, harvested from the same exact field. This plant has uh, flowers at the top. And then this plant over here, uh, probably in a previous grazing had uh, the, all the flower heads uh, grazed off in the boot stage. And there's something going on in these plants that I just like to point out. If we look at the base of the base of them, again, this is that plant, the, the flowers have been cut off, but this is still a flower, the same flowering plant. If we look at the base, I, I said that tillers represent the new stems on, uh, on these grass plants. You can see the, the thickened flower stems here are tillers, and there's just not a lot of other activity going on at the base of this plant. Whereas in this one, it's, it's already past uh, its flowering, its need to flower for this year. New, what we call vegetative tillers have exploded from the base of this. And there's just a lot of tillers, a lot of density down by the soil line. And, uh, and what's going on here is that, um, that as these flowering seed heads, they actually produce a plant hormone that inhibits the, the growth of these, these new vegetative tillers 
until such time as as the seed is ripe and, and dry. Then it's going to uh, invest more energy in new tillers, building up energy for for the winter time. But it uh, in the meantime, which could be until the end of July or August, until that uh, seed is ripe. Uh, we're going to get less production, not only less quality here, but we're going to inhibit the, the growth of this, this new uh, green uh, material for the rest of the year. And this is what it looks like in the field. Uh, these grasses, if we were to look higher, have uh, flowering seed heads. You can see that these are the flowering stalks, uh, quite thick, uh, poor feed quality. But look at the, at the ground level too. Uh, just not a lot of activity here, a lot of old last year's uh, uh, mulched uh, grasses down there, but not a lot of growth. And then that same field, again, where, where the seed heads have been removed, we've brought down green growth much closer to the soil level, a lot higher density. Uh, and so we just like to move from, you know, this, this scenario to this, as quickly as possible then to minimize the window uh, for when dairy cows are having to deal with that, that kind of forage. It, it really does matter getting past the flowering stage as quickly as possible. So a number of ways to do it. We've all uh, thought and uh, utilized different techniques. This is uh, utilizing a group of heifers at a high density to not only uh, eat that, those seed heads, but trample the rest. And how we get rid of those seed heads uh, and the hormone influence they exert on the rest of the plants doesn't really matter then. So they trampling, eating, or clipping, uh, we all end up we end up with the same result, uh, freeing those new vegetative tillers to be able to to grow back and recover. Now there's a a few seed heads in this uh, in this particular pasture, and this is really just cosmetic. If we can keep you know, the number of seed heads uh, down to, to less, you know, less than 10%, you know, 5% of, of what's growing there, we're not going to really change, change the yield. This may look um, unsightly from, from the roadside, but really when you walk out here, you'd see that this is still really high quality forage and, and it's probably not worth going out with a mold. Yep, and so we still have that option of clipping. Uh, another option, which is becoming more and more popular, but I just want to mention it in case people have not heard of it, is actually pre-clipping. So what, what we'll do, uh, say, af after those uh, grass flowers begin to emerge from the boot, um, we know that that forage quality is dropping, and, and it's just not as palatable either. We can go out with a mower and, and clip, um, before the cows go out, um, it, it exposes some of the green leaves that are down below the flowers uh, that cows may not go after. Uh, get, we get a little bit higher percentage uh, of that headed out pasture utilized by cows, let them pick through it. It wilts a little bit, um, it, which is helpful too in, in helping cows uh, fill up completely too. They're not eating quite as much water. Now, if we, if we clip this, leave it lay in a windrow, don't rake it, don't uh, tet it, don't do anything else with it. This is still considered grazing uh, for organic certification purposes then. So we're still getting days, days grazing and our percent uh, grazing in take two. Uh, this is still considered go out and clip uh, in the morning. If we're gonna have a couple of nice days, you could actually clip more than one day's worth and just move a poly wire across these windrows. Um, to, to make better use. And, and maybe you only have to do this for two weeks to get through that uh, flowering grass stage then. Uh, another, just as an aside, another use for, for this pre-clipping is if you've got a pasture that's really high in legume content and it's just, you know, it's gonna make it hard for you to sleep at night for fear of bloat. Um, clipping and letting those, uh, those legumes wilt uh, for just a little bit really does decrease the risk of, of bloating uh, uh, on those pastures. So this is something you could do uh, for those high legume uh, fields too. And so this is what it, what it looks like uh, in person, all of the 
uh, the descriptions I've been trying to point out on graphs, then uh, the field on the left has had plenty of recovery time, but you can see that it's still almost all vegetative still. Uh, cows are going to fill up. They're, they're really going to utilize this forage and the energy contained in it really well. Uh, you can, if you look at their rumens, they're, they're not nearly as full as the cows on the right. The cows on the right look really full, but that forage quality is limiting and they, that forage is sitting in the rumen too long. Um, and, the, you know, the cows on the right are, even though they look really full, they're not going to be producing well and they're actually probably going to be thinner on average than those cows on the left then. Um, and both of these particular herds happen to be um, all uh, grass-fed uh, herds then too. So really that, that picture on the left, um, you know, another way of thinking about what these pastures should look like is if the cows got into the hay field uh, right before it was ready to clip. That's, that's really what we're looking for. And as far as managing this kind of pasture um, to get efficient utilization of it, it really is gonna come down to making sure we get the area right, uh, that we don't give cows too much of this. We make them eat, you know, at least half, uh, maybe 60 and sometimes 70% of this forage then by just limiting the area that they have access to to match what they need. Okay, so that's, that's springtime and uh, flowering. The thing I wanted to point out here is, so those, those flowers and seed heads are gone. And this is how those plants, those grass plants grow for the rest of the year. You can see that now that the quality does not change very quickly at all um, from, from day to day. This is a different situation than we had in the spring. And this is, we can utilize this fact to really start to lengthen out rest periods then. We're not in such uh, a rush to get back to them. You know, if we can lengthen things out, you know, into the 30s, you know, sometimes these, these pastures need 40 plus days, you know, in really hot or drier conditions. Uh, we're still maintaining some, some decent uh, quality, dairy quality forage. Uh, and, and again, allowing those plants to fully recover, develop a deep root system and, and develop true resilience then. And again, just another picture of, of what this looks like. Um, this, is, this is not headed out uh, dried down grasses like in the previous picture, what, what we might imagine that uh, mob grazing looks like then. Um, and if we look at the rumens, the left sides of these cows, they're, they're adequately full without, without, again, being over full. Not a hay belly forage is moving through these cows uh, very well. Okay. So this is, um, I, I'm gonna try to make an argument for uh, always feeding some stored forage uh, along with uh, pasture, um, both for uh, main, for uh, keeping uh, uh, a consistent forage base for those bacteria in the rumen, but also just uh, for managing pasture and pasture intake better. And this is, uh, this graph is a, um, an experiment that's been done over and over again, again, particularly in New Zealand, Ireland, they love to do this study here. And what we've got here across the bottom is the pasture allowance or what they're calling herbage allowance. So how much do we have to offer to the cows? How much pasture did we offer to the cows? And then how much did they actually eat? And that's on the vertical side here. So, you know, it, you hear people talk about maximizing pasture intake then. What does it really take to, to maximize? And so maximum pasture intake in this picture here is where this curve flattens out. Cows are not eating anymore and they just, poss they just can't possibly eat anymore. So they, they, uh, even though we offer them more, they don't eat anymore. And I'd, I'd like to just point out what's happening at the point where where these curves flatten out then for all different uh, grain or no grain, and then uh, the genetics, uh, Frisian or grazing genetics versus US Holstein or, or non-grazing genetics then. But what happens is, you know, say for, for this line here, we need to offer them uh, about 150 pounds of, uh, of, of pasture, dry matter, in order to get them to eat about, you know, 30 to 35 pounds of uh, pasture intake. Um, 
you know, maybe, maybe they could, we could squeeze 40 into them. But, you know, we, we've talked about pasture intake, you know, take half, leave half is a, is a common, commonly used uh, phrase. This would be, you know, take 30%, leave 70%. So now we're really looking at uh, inefficient pasture harvest. You can make this work by using a leader follower system, you know, just let the lactating cows take 30%. Um, it's, it's hard for most people to do that um, it, just because of logistics uh, on the pasture. So most people don't have a leader follower system. Um, and so uh, what I'd argue is, you know, maybe let them, you know, get it, rather than going for maximum intake, you know, let them get, you know, 90% uh, intake or 80% intake. And then in the barn, uh, offer them a really digestible uh, forage. Again, we get benefits uh, to rumen health and butterfat production and, and a benefit to uh, pasture management too. We can still have our cows take 50, 60% of the pasture and know that we've maximized their dry matter intake. So, um, at Organic Valley, we talk a lot about keeping five pounds of good quality dry hay or, or fairly dry haylage in the ration then. Again, the quality of that can be, you know, it can be uh, excess perennial pasture that you harvested and you're feeding now, but is of good quality or could be purchased in supplemental style uh, forages. So again, uh, how well that these forages got digested depends not only on the quality of them when they're growing, but how well that rumen functions digests them. And so there's some other things we can do to enhance that. Uh, one being buffers. Um, you know, even though we're the rations or you know maybe only four to six pounds of grain, buffers still play a role then. Uh, they've been shown to raise butter fat, uh, even in the absence of uh, rumen acidosis or excess grain feeding then. So, you know, uh, incorporating, you know, three to four ounces of, of sodium bicarb is really cheap. And, uh, and it just keeps that, uh, that forage digestion in the, in the right range. That's uh, something that I didn't mention before for the bacteria to digest these cell walls properly, um, the pH needs to be in a fairly narrow range then, um, about 6.7. And buffers help us keep it in that uh, appropriate range then. So they're cheap and easy to use and you do see a benefit in, in butterfat production. Yeast products, um, they've been shown to, to help uh, those uh, bacteria digest the fiber better. Um, so, you know, something like a, a Diamond V product, um, uh, um, you know, Altec maybe uh, might have a product that, that could enhance uh, forage digestion. And then sugars and um, mixed starches then. So the bacteria, as they break down that, uh, that fiber, a little bit of sugar, uh, you know, or grain, you know, at the four to six pound range, is really enhancing uh, the, the activity of the bacteria in the rumen and, and helps us get the most of those forages um, that, that we've been talking about and fit from the sugars uh, and, you know, why that four to six pounds of, uh, of grain fed to in a high forage ration really does more work than you would expect it to do then. It's, it is really enhancing how that rumen functions. Okay, so another thing that, that dramatically affects rumen health is heat stress. Um, you know, cows eat less, that's, that's true, but they, they do, they chew their cud less um, and, and the saliva contains buffers or bicarb. And, and so these animals really do suffer a change in rumen health and their ability to, to digest forages. So reducing heat stress in the summer is important. And it really doesn't matter, you know, kind of what, what you've chosen as your strategy. Uh, we've got um, a building here, uh, silvopasture or portable shade uh, or shade in the pastures as well then. The one thing that's uh, common to all three of these uh, scenarios is that the animals still have feed available. So moving them into shade without feed available 
is, uh, you know, of, of, it does help them with, uh, you know, the heat stress, but they're not going to eat any more then. So make sure that if you bring them into a building or, or put them under trees, that there's feed available at the same time then. The other thing that's different between these, these two pictures, these are confinement U.S. Holsteins that, that uh, don't deal with heat as well. And these are, these are all animals and breeds that, that tolerate much more heat. Again, part of a resilient system, that part of the system that we're, that we're trying to uh, produce a living from. So that's, that's the end. And I, I guess, again, it just um, what I really want to try to emphasize is, is that we can utilize uh, these truly uh, job of uh, feeding and producing milk. And I think that we're, we're developing more knowledge and techniques um, to, to make this work better. You know, baleage is a huge help. You know, if we're going to use new forage varieties, we have to plant new pastures, you know, use the um, really highly digestible perennial species then. Um, but it, it can be done. And I think that, you know, maybe the, these perennials are undervalued and and that the the value of the annual forages or corn silage uh, are overvalued then um, that we can still do just as good of a job uh, with the perennials so with that uh, i would uh, stop here and uh, we can uh, answer some questions and have a discussion thank you Okay, so thanks so much, uh, Dr. Berkner, for doing that. Um, sorry, folks, that there was uh, some internet issues, connectivity when we were recording it, but because it was uh, basically because you could still understand what was being said, we decided to go with that. And uh, hopefully it was all right for everybody. I'd like to uh, invite uh, Matt Baumgartner to, to unmute and um, uh, help guide the question and answer session. Matt, if you could uh, do that. And, and uh, Dr. Berkner, thanks for being here. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry yeah. about that sound quality. Matt's one of our, one of Organic Valley's farmers in uh, Lebanon County, Pennsylvania. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Berkner, for uh, presenting. I know on my dairy farm, uh, we're going to a perennial, perennial system and it's uh, very good information. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll go to the chat box to answer some of these questions that came up. Uh, any new questions can come through the chat box. Uh, first one that came up was, any leaf count or similar for corn recovery? And they also mentioned clover trickery and plantains. Right, so um, we, I focused on the grass. Um, you know, we've developed a system for, for uh, evaluating them and, and they're the predominant species and it turns out that if we if we give our grasses these perennial grass species enough time all the other forb and legume species will also have received enough time too then so by by focusing in on the grasses we we do cover um you know protecting all these other forb and legume species then so we can you know, just, just know that that's going to be the case. We're not going to be shorting any other species or pushing them out because of that. Then there's another follow-up question about the nutrition of those broadleaf uh, plants. Yeah. Yep. And uh, those, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the legume species that we use and also the forbs, they tend to maintain quality uh, throughout a, a wider range. Um, you know, we can graze flowering uh, clover species and, and know that they're, they're still really high quality. If we have alfalfa out there, um, actually the, the cows will, will self-regulate the quality of that. They'll leave those uh, more lignified lower stems uh, behind and, and let them do that too then. Uh, so it, it does. It does still work out. We're going to maintain uh, quality in those forbs and legumes by, uh, again, focusing in on the grass species. Uh, next question: uh, Can I feed? <clears throat> can I free choice sodium bicarbonate in my free choice mineral feeder, or should I add uh, that to my grain ration? Right. 
if, if the option is there, if you have a grain ration uh, or, you know, TMR or whatever you've got, if you can force feed that bicarb, that would be best to put it into directly into the mix. Uh, and if you don't have that option, uh, you're all grass, um, then, then do provide it free choice. They, they may not eat quite that three to four ounces um, that you'd, you'd like them to, but it's, but it's better than nothing then. Um, Could you do both? You, you could do both. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then the other nice thing about having free choice bicarb there is you can use it. Uh, the cows will tell you if, if they're having a rumen upset, uh, they will uh, increase their consumption of bicarb. And it's a, a chance to, to ask yourself what's what's going on. Is there is there a problem here that I need to address? So, yeah, it's, it's good to have some uh, at least one source of free choice, if only for that reason, and they never really ever touch it then. Yep. What advice do you have for switching TMR conventional cows to pasture grain hay ration, making it as smooth as possible? Yeah, um, you know, this is, this is actually uh, a really interesting question. Um, and, and the microbiome, uh, you know, we talk about microbiomes, but the bacteria, the populations and species that are in the rumen of uh, a conventionally fed herd versus a high forage fed herd or grazing herd are, are quite a bit different. And uh, it's going to take some time to, to switch them over. Uh, I would say probably increasing the, if you can start with the TMR side of it, increasing the amount of forage in that TMR uh, will enhance the, the number of forage digesting bacteria and they'll be the same ones that, that deal with the pasture forage as well then. So I, I just start by increasing the amount of forage in the ration in general. Uh, another aside on that is um, that, you know, I, I have mentioned a couple of times about using um, conventional genetics, particularly Holstein and also conventional Jersey genetics. Um, it turns out they've, they've done some work and uh, those, those animals actually support a different population of bacteria in their rumens, regardless of whatever ration they're fed. Um, you know, and it really does make sense. You know, we talk about differences in uh, species of soil bacteria that we find around plant roots, you know, for different species of plants, uh, and that 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 will vary. Um, and, the, and the same thing is happening in the rumen of these of these cows. So not only are we selecting for milk production, but we're, you know, inadvertently selecting for different uh, populations of bacteria. So, you know, they um, that that's one of the limitations of using conventional. Uh, Holstein Jersey genetics on a pasture system, and 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 part of the reason for changing the uh, the bulls that we're using on these on these farms. So. And I know I've I've seen interesting results with heifers that were uh, raised on grass versus not. They just right. attack that pasture better. You bet. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it's going it's going through them um, more quickly too. Then, uh, or they're making better use of it, right? So early on, you mentioned uh, you manage some ground that has a, a stand that's 15 years old. Yeah. What are you doing to maintain that stand and keep it productive? Sure. Um, so doing soil tests and, and addressing uh, the issues that I that I need to address then. So maintaining the fertility, um, that's that's critical. Um, and then uh, I, I have... Uh, a small no-till drill. And so I can, if I notice an area that's become thinner, I want to add some, I can add some legumes to it. Uh, sometimes if I need an immediate ad addressing of density, I would also incorporate maybe some Italian ryegrass, uh, an, uh, an annual ryegrass, high digestibility. Um, it's aggressive enough in the seeding seedling stage that it can compete in, in a perennial pasture. Um, you know, trying to add perennials to it is a little, a little trickier unless you've had a lot of uh, winter kill or a lot of damage to it then. Um, so that's another way I, I maintain the quality of those, of those fields. And um, I, I'm feeling like this is, you know, uh, something I, I'm never going to um, 
do any kind of tillage on these fields. Again, it'll just be fertility management and, and no tilling uh, from time to time to, to maintain quality. And then, and then critical is, you know, how we, how we harvest it and, and baleage is a huge help. And I, I think that this, uh, the discussion around uh, hay in a day techniques uh, to maintain some, uh, some of the uh, sugars and, and some of that quality as well can be a, a huge help. And uh, this year uh, for myself, I, I'm going to have a, a piece of equipment that will allow me to, to cut, cut the hay to do, to try a uh, hay in a day and see if we can boost that quality digestibility just a titch more then. Folks, I want to interject just to ask you to please do an evaluation. The link is in the chat box. Um, we're at the hour. I don't know uh, if we can go a little bit longer with you, Dr. Berkner, if you're willing, if there's anything else. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm free. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, here a question just came. What is the optimum moisture content for harvesting baleage for the cow digestibility and palatability? Yeah, so the... the um, the same, the same uh, moisture that allows for proper fermentation then. So, you know, that, that 40% 40, 40 would, be, would be nice. The, the hay in a day, uh, it, it, we're hoping to, to get it uh, wilted and, and dried down to that, uh, to that point. You have to be a little bit careful then. Uh, it may not work every, every cutting every time, and you may have to let it go overnight then too. But uh, you know, whatever, whatever gives us the best fermentation uh, in, in the bale is, is going gonna, is gonna to be best for the cow. And you said 40% moisture. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Um, and I, I would have a question also from the, the forage sample you had given. Uh, you said 27% of your dry matter is from fiber and you compared it to the 21%. Um, what if right. you would put a, a number on that? How much more milk do you think you could get? And um, I know I know it's a very yeah very yeah difficult. Yeah, I I I haven't really thought about it in those terms, but I I would say uh, at least a at least a uh, a couple pounds uh, okay. if you were feeding strictly that then and, and like I I pointed out the problems with feeding that other that other forage at a, at a really high level and. and I guess again, I just wanted to emphasize. Really, I, I'm trying to trying to say that you know that NDF isn't isn't all isn't all bad then, and it really does represent a a pool of energy that we can tap into. Yep. Uh, a few other questions popped in. Uh, any other advice or, or opinions on breeds such as brown Swiss, uh, Asher? Um, you, you know it. it at that point, it does become uh, sort of uh, personal preference, but still within that within that group, you know, choosing animals that have been selected under uh, you know grazing or high forage conditions for a long time, it, it really does matter. So you know, say if you were going to get some uh, Ayrshire genetics, um, you can get Ayrshire genetics from New Zealand, or you can get them from you know conventionally raised. Uh, cows and bulls here in the United States. And, and obviously I'm going to prefer to get uh, those genetics from New Zealand if possible then. Uh, and the same goes, even if, if you're buying a, 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 you know, a jumper bull, you know, buy it from a farm that, uh, you know, has been, has been grazing or feeding this the way you want to feed for a long time. And you're, you're likely to get some of those other benefits along with it. Okay. Uh, next one is is there more benefit to feeding dry hay over baleage for butter fat and rumen health? Yeah, it does seem that the dry the dry hay works a little bit better at um, you know those benefits in maintaining that that uh, fiber mat and and slowing down the digestion. But um, so if you had the choice, I, I would go with a high quality dry. Um, it, unfortunately, it means for a lot of us, you know, here in the humid part of the world it's harder to make and that might end up being purchased feed. And if you're used to doing that, that'd be fine. But if you really, you know, if you do have some, some, some dryish baleage, uh, it, it would come pretty close to it then. Yeah. yeah I believe that's all the questions. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks Matt for 
uh, chiming in here. And uh, thank you, Dr. Berkner, again, for your presentation. Um, sure. Folks, uh, there is the evaluation link in the chat box and thread if you're willing to take a couple minutes to do that. We'd really appreciate it. Uh, otherwise, I'll wish you all a good day. All right. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. Bye now. Thank yeah, you. great to have you.